Hello, everyone. Welcome back to today's podcast. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's podcast, I'm going to drink some coffee. So no tea this week. It feels like a coffee afternoon. So I have it right here. It's very full and I'm going to attempt not to spill it while I do this podcast. So today's podcast is moving off of last week's podcast. So if you have not seen it, I do recommend you watch that one first and then hop into this one. We're going to discuss basically how to do whatever you want in huge quotation marks. Because usually when people, you know, when I hear that, at least in my bubble, I'll hear, um, you can't just do whatever you want, you know, in that tone. And it's because people who often dream of doing whatever they want might be depicted in the story as people who want to take advantage of other people. I'm going to assume you don't want to take advantage of anyone. I don't want to take advantage of anyone, which means to maliciously target people in vulnerable situations in order to manipulate them in a, in a way that benefits me and probably hurts them, right? Like nobody wants to do that. So for those of people who do, we're not talking about you. We're talking about perfectly decent people, which I think most people are, who just want to do what they want with their life, right? They want to have a job that makes sense. They want to pay rent that makes sense. They want to have a family if that makes sense. They just want to have a normal, peaceful existence. But how do you do that in a world that is dictated by maybe some people with bad intentions, right? How do you how do you make sure that you don't become a person with bad intentions? And more than that, how do you even make it make sense in a world that feels really overwhelming? So I have my notes here. I created a little bit of a formula. It's what I use again in my own life. Maybe you can use it in yours. There's no guarantee this could help you, but I really think that personally, as somebody who struggled her whole life to sort of find her place in the universe, it came with a lot of, Un deeply understanding myself and what I wanted and needed, which are two different things. And then what did the world want and need? And how do we kind of meet each other in the middle between those two things? So I have my notes here and this is my biggest concern. I don't want people to watch this podcast and think of those really ill-intentioned people. You'll probably often hear it from, let's say, religious people. Have you ever heard it from a very specific type of religious person who's like, without the Bible, how will we know what to do? Or, oh, if the Bible didn't exist, if God didn't exist, if hell wasn't a consequence, just imagine if people just did whatever they wanted, how much pain and suffering they would cause to the world. I think they're sort of telling on themselves. I have no desire to cause pain and suffering to the world. If anything, I'm trying to harm or reduce. So it seems kind of interesting that their brain assumes that if hell isn't a consequence, people would be, quote, bad, which is like a very interesting idea, right? And I think that's a relationship they're having with themselves. People that say God is the reason they aren't tempted to do evil. I think that's fair to use God as like your compass, but I think what I use as my compass is my character. So going back to last week's episode, that podcast is how to be a whole human being, which fundamentally is about the foundation of why you think you're on the planet. What do you think you're doing here? What's your relationship with existing? And where do your values come from? So in this podcast, I want to sort of expand upon not the people who, again, are kind of faulty with their values, but people that actually feel like the world is overwhelming because they wish the world was kinder, because they believe in the optimism of people in general, but they know that People suffer under occupation or discrimination or racism or homophobia. Like there is a difficulty on sharing space with people that see you the way you're born as inherently inferior. And so that causes a lot of negativity and might cause you to feel negative thoughts towards another person. But if you don't want to engage in those negative thoughts and you still want to exist in the world, how do you do that? That's really who I'm thinking about for this podcast because that was me, right? I was a person who grew up very passionately, had very strong political views. I wanted to help the world. But every time I felt like I was helping, I felt like the world was like drowning in a way in their own sort of like self-inflicted suffering. Even though not all suffering is self-inflicted, a large portion of the world is suffering because of the way that we meet each other, the way that we humanize or dehumanize one another. So how do I make sure that I don't fall into that dehumanization? Well, I have to humanize myself and then humanize others in the process process. We've been talking a lot on stream lately about sort of like Palestine and Israel as an example. And I want to make sure that it's clear, like all of our babies cry the same, all of us suffer the same, all of us want to live and die in dignity. And that's really difficult to sort of make happen in a world that feels like no matter where you are in the world, somebody is using your identity to sort of push a narrative. And that's why I say politics doesn't have peace. Politics is about winning. 
So you have to separate yourself from existence, other people's constructs in order to form the construct that makes the best sense in your life. So how do I do what I want every day? I do it within the construct. So even on stream, there's an implication from my language sometimes that people hear me incorrectly and they'll think Brittany doesn't engage in constructs. Brittany believes everything's a construct. So I created a construct in my own inner safety, my own bubble that allows me to do what I want every day. And that's because I have orchestrated the construct. So I'm going to give you the skills to sort of orchestrate your own construct within reason and in positive symbiosis with the world outside of you, because we still have to live in a society. We have to compromise. We have to make peace with differences, right? So as an example, um, you know, we live in a world where people are like, let's say drinking, eating, sleeping themselves into their couches while binging Netflix or TikTok. And people look at them and say, oh, you're so lazy. Oh, you just do whatever you want. You know, real people have responsibilities. They're not doing whatever they want. You're coping. These people who are eating, binging themselves, you know, watching Netflix all day, who, these people who are living a life where they feel like they can't do much and this is the best they can do, those people aren't living, they're surviving. So first we need to separate surviving from living. Being alive does not mean to live. It means to exist. So when you are born into the world, you're born into usually a survival situation because you have yet to have a relationship with living, which comes from your own relationship with self and the world outside of you. So you're existing and existence. So every time you have a baby, that baby goes on a journey of having its own relationship with surviving and living. And that is personal to them. No matter how much privilege a child is born into, they still don't know how to live until they really have that relationship with themselves. And this is a philosophical you know, conversation, right? We're not talking politically. We're not talking about in your religion. We're talking philosophically, metaphysically. We're talking about something greater than our constructs perception of self. We're talking about something that allows you to sit with yourself and say like, what am I? What is this? What is this thing that I'm experiencing? Are you your thoughts, your actions, or the fact that you just experience? These are all questions you have to answer for yourself, right? So instead of being a person that's stuck in your surviving, which is very reasonable. We want to get you to the other side, which is living. And that's really difficult because in order to get there, you sort of have to accept that the world itself it's on, is on its own personal journey between the two. So I wrote down a little formula here. Surviving is doing what you have to. So your needs, food, water, shelter, let's just use those as the basics. And living, doing what you want is needs plus wants plus how equal symbiosis, right? So your survival needs are usually your basics, food, water, shelter. And that can be really, really hard to figure out. It's so difficult in the world. It has always been difficult. It has never been easy. And even people in privileged situations where their family can like give them those things, they still have to learn how to live. And if their family spoils them too much, they actually don't know how to survive. They simply know how to exist sort of in the in their family's bubble who knows how to survive right so if you're really really sheltered and really really privileged and you've never learned to be on your own you do not know how to survive if you are incredibly not privileged and you're in poverty and you're barely making it and you're doing the base like you're not surviving you are you let me rephrase you are surviving but you don't have the skills to survive and this is this is very specific at least to my brain Everyone survives by just staying alive. Then there's knowing how to survive. So like actually understanding the mechanisms of society and how to move within it. And then there's surviving into living and living also, it, you know, as, as the foundation involves surviving, but you're living because now you have a, a reasonable relationship, a symbiotic positive relationship with the fact that you have to feed, clothe you know, house yourself with the fact that you have to have some sort of way to gather, you know, resources in order to move your life forward. I like personally, the way that I do it is I like to remember that like we're evolved animals on a planet, that we're living history, that all the times in history that came before us, it's just modern times. You know, sometimes I talk to my religious family and I say, you know, it's funny that you have so many issues with like Zeus and the gods. But the reality is like we're living in that time. We just call them different names. Or if we even look at, you know, what we did to the Native Americans, like you look at that relationship with the word genocide and you look at that relationship with how we took over land or how previous Americans took over that land. 
And it's going to happen again now and it's going to happen again in the future because that's how humans have been as a species. And so I take a very zoomed out lens perspective as much as I can, the macro, because I really do believe that we're here for a short time and then we die, hopefully in dignity, and then we move on to whatever that looks like. So while I'm here for this short time, I have to accept that I am just living history like my ancestors, that I do not know when other forces of humans will come against my force, how other animals will come against my animal. I do not know how the world will shift. I do not know if I'm going to be alive tomorrow. All I know is that I have to do the best I can with what I can and I, with what I have, and then I can live within that. I can live within a radical acceptance construct, but I can only survive if I haven't accepted this, if I haven't accepted this, then I can only survive because in survival, we feel unsure of why things are happening. We're just trying to get through the day in living. You understand why things are happening. And so you can accept the fact that you're in flow in that moment. It's like accepting your fate, if you will. Not that I don't though. Okay. So I obviously believe we're destined in some ways. And then I think we have control over that destiny. And so the relationship you're having with that is going to come down to you. You have to decide what that means. So a lot of people kind of cope with survival with God. Have you ever heard those people on like Christian call-in shows where they'll be like, my life was a mess. I was addicted. I was in poverty. And then all of a sudden I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And even though I'm still struggling, everything is better. That's just a shift in perception, but it feels similar to the cope that I see with people who just binge, you know, binge Netflix and binge food and never do anything more with their life. And I think what it is is the cope element is hard to see the difference between the cope and the living element, which is why on my level system, there's like a, a categorization system of differences in relationship to self. So a 2C might be a person who copes with Jesus Christ and a 2B might be a person who has a much greater understanding of sort of living and surviving, but has a relationship that's a little bit more reasonable, like a little less cope, but still, you know, and then maybe the, the 2A has still, it's a cope, but it's like a little bit of a without God, without the constructs being totally objective. And then it goes on and on and on and on. And so again, when we're having these sort of relationships with self, we're trying to categorize ourselves according, like appropriately with it with who we are in the story. So this gets down to what's your story. And I knew in my life at 30, which was my pivotal personal moment in my life, like the biggest moment in my life, I couldn't let this be my story. I didn't, I was looking at my life and everything that it was going to be. And I was like this, I don't want this to be my story. And so I shifted gears and I learned how to live my life but that fully came with me recognizing how much power and control I had in my own life and shifting my own story because ultimately I am talking about driving my own train, being completely in charge of my life, not in charge of others. I can't control what you do. I can't stop a person from running a red light. I can't stop a school shooter. I can't stop a nuke that's going to fall on my head. I can't stop a genocide, but I can decide what my two legs do, what my brain does, how I interact with the world and how I play this game in quotation marks or how I dictate my story. Because I think I'm only going to be here for a short time and then I'm going to die and I don't really believe in an afterlife personally, it allows me to radically accept that one, the simplicity of my life is good enough. That two, we're here and then we're not. Three, no one will remember me. And four, even if people remember me, one day, the last person on earth who remembers me will die. And I truly will cease to exist. And even though we remember historical figures, we only remember the version of them that people tell us about. The consciousness that was that person, no one will ever know because anyone who might have known them isn't here anymore. Not in a real way, right? So even when history writes your story, like it's never really you in the same way that when you see somebody, you know, have an opinion about somebody you like or know on the internet, or maybe you, you yourself, if you're a content creator, you're like, that's not who I am. People don't know who you are, but you know who you are. You have so much power to have in a relationship with that version of who you know you are. So I knew who I was. I knew I wasn't hurting people at least not on purpose. And when I was, I apologized to the best of my ability. I knew I didn't want to hurt people in general. That wasn't a motivation of mine. I didn't want to take advantage of anyone. I just wanted to live a really peaceful life. I just wanted to wake up feeling safe and go to bed feeling safe and then accept the fact that when I felt unsafe in the world, I would still manage to keep myself centered. 
People do this constantly. There are human beings around the world who are constantly keeping themselves stable in the middle of really hard situations. And I wanted to be like them. I wanted to be like my ancestors. I wanted to be people, you know, my family's from the Middle East. And the more and more I listen to stories, whether it's from Palestinians or from Iraqis or from whoever, there is a group of people who maintain their civility, their hope, their kindness, and their compassion, no matter how much pain and suffering they're experiencing. And I admire those people. And so my, my sort of, um, the sort of memory that I evoke when I'm feeling out of control is sort of like a memory of no matter how chaotic the world is, you can maintain your joy. So that's kind of what I want you guys to think and consider is that even though right now you're in survival mode, when you're in living mode, it doesn't mean you then control the world. It means you've let go of the need to control it and you accept whatever comes in and out. And instead of fighting the wave, you write it. We're riding the wave. We're not fighting the wave, right? So when you're living your life, you still have to cover the basics. You still have to survive, but then you get to do whatever you want. So then, it, you know, it begs the question, what would you do if you could do anything you wanted every day? Now, usually when this hypothetical is asked, people imagine like, oh, I'm a billionaire and I can do whatever I want. Just note to self, being a billionaire does not equal freedom because how'd you become that billionaire? Whose family tie are you associated? Like whose family, like, um, reputation are you tied to? How much freedom could you possibly have in a legacy family? Like, trust me, there is freedom and there's freedom to be had in different ways. And actually in stream next week, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more because I think people have such an idea of freedom that whatever it is in your head is probably not that. It, the freedom you have in your head when you're in survival mode is only to get out of survival mode. It has nothing to do with living. So let's say survival mode was taken care of, but how do you take care of it? So the formula is living is doing what you want, needs, so basics, okay, plus wants, what do you actually want, and how are you going to do it? And that creates a symbiosis, right? So I could figure out my needs. My whole life, I was able to live on my own. I could rent apartments or rooms. I was always able to work two to three jobs. That wasn't really the problem. The problem was that even though I could do this basics, I wasn't doing what I wanted. And it was driving me a little crazy. Now, we all have to do things we don't want because we're adults and we have to, you know, we have to pay tax and do all these things. But truthfully, it's a matter of how do I accept that I live in a society? And in order to live in a society, we do pay tax. We do participate. We're good citizens. How do I do that? Plus, love my life. Plus, not feel like I'm always under the weight and pressure of society. Well, I do what I want, right? So this looks like a form of rebellion, but rebellion is often a form of feeling out of place. I don't feel out of place. I'm no longer rebellion. I'm rebelling. I'm simply living my life. This is the stage that I'm in now. But I remember initially it was a form of rebellion. I want to do whatever I want. Brittany does whatever she wants. I'm going to do what I want. Don't tell me what to do. But now in my mid thirties, I'm not rebelling. There's no one to rebel against. I have simply created a life that I love. And that took a lot of hard work and it took a lot of suffering because again, I had to learn how to suffer wisely. So that's a part of the journey as well. So needs plus wants, how? So how do I fuel my needs? How do I complete my wants? And how do I create that symbiosis? It's not that you won't have hard days. It's not that you won't be stressed about money or health. It's not that you're gonna control other people. You're simply having a relationship with yourself. So I do what I want every day within reason, within reason, within reason in consideration of my mental health, my physical health, my spiritual health, my financial health, and what other people are doing around me. Within reason, I do what I want every day. So if my body is aching and I can't work, I don't work because I get to do that. I'm not in survival mode anymore. I figured out how to work enough days during the month to have a little bit of leeway to give myself a day or two off. Of course, I normally work every day with an allowance of having time off. And I'm not exhausted by that in the same way I would be working five days a week at a nine to five. See, when I was working outside of the home, when I was working my regular jobs, when I was doing other things, even working that less time during the week felt more intense than working every day at a job I love. It's not that the jobs are easier or harder, but their details of those jobs make it easier or harder for my brain. You're playing to your strengths. So as an example, um, I don't like commuting. I commuted most of my life, as many of you have. 
and it's annoying driving an hour to work, an hour back, two hours in traffic. California is crazy. Gas prices are insane. Wear and tear in your car is just, it's so exhaustingly stressful. And that is the norm for so many people. If you know Southern California, how many of us drove to the 15, to the 91, all the way from, you know, Southern California to another part of Southern California just to get to work. You know what I mean? So it's stressful doing this. This is not a this is not the way that I would like to survive in the world, but I have survived that way before. So then I had to ask myself, okay, if I'm willing to survive this way, am I willing to live this way? And the answer was no, I'm not willing to live this way. Then I figured out content creation, even though I had thought about it since out of high school, even though I had dreamed of it, I didn't know how to really turn it into a business. Turning it into a business is a whole different game than just doing it and thinking, oh, I'll get famous and it will work. Oh, I'll go viral once and it will maintain. Oh, I'll just get a million views on a video and that's it. My career is set. Not my story. My story was never one of those stories. And honestly, because I don't feel entitled to anything, I don't feel bitter about the fact that my career n didn't have those moments. So many people around me would get like 300,000 views on a video and boom, their career was set forever. Or they'd get a million views on a video and their career was set forever. Never had to worry about it. Always maintained. I was never that person. I would get those videos. I would get those views, but it never maintained. And a big part of it was because it wasn't my story. And it wasn't my story because honestly of me, I didn't want it to be. I was changing too often. I was switching political groups. I was reading too much. I was me battling my mental health. No matter how many opportunities came my way to go from surviving to living, it wasn't the right avenue for me. And a lot of people wondered, like, why didn't you take that opportunity? Because it just would have been a different version of surviving. I just would have been making more money. And it just wasn't worth it to me. It wasn't worth what it feels like to me, which is like selling my soul, which is such a dramatic like kind of statement to make in a world where I think we're evolved animals, but I just didn't want to like sell my soul. So then you have to play, you know, you have to have that conversation with yourself. What am I willing to do that doesn't feel like it's eating away at my soul? Because that is a very intense question to ask yourself. Many people can work a regular job and never feel like it's eating at their soul, which is good, right? That's good. Some people, though, can't do certain jobs without it feeling like they're doing something very immoral. So for you, you have to figure out what is the thing that isn't going to make me feel like I'm selling my soul. So YouTube is that thing for me. I just love it. I love everything I do on the internet, right? Like every single part of it I love and I don't feel bad about it and I think it's really good. Now, will I make mistakes? Will I change how I do things? Will I grow as a content creator? 1,000 billion percent but I don't feel bad being a content creator. I don't feel bad doing OF. I don't feel bad doing what I do for a living. I feel really good about it. Now, I feel really good about being a nanny as an example. I did feel good being a nanny. It was a great job. I really helped community members. I, I was doing really good, I think, in general, but it was eating at my soul because ultimately it didn't fuel my joy. I loved those babies. They're really, really great. Like the families were great, but I didn't feel fulfilled and I couldn't just go to work and make the money. Something was missing. And that thing that was missing was the same thing that gets me up every day to work. And at the end of the day, makes me stay up hours through the night working because it's so fulfilling. Even when I'm in pain, even when I take a day off, even when I'm like, oh my gosh, I just want to not think about this. I ultimately always come back to it. So again, you're, you, can't f you can't figure out these things, like anything about your life until you know who you are. So that's why you do life. So you can actually put it to the test. Is this what I want? Is this what I want? Look, every part of the population will serve to be some category of the population. So the population that basically like the same little, t um, I'm watching um, Kevin can go F himself right now on Netflix. Someone's gotta be this population of the community. I wouldn't want it to be my story. And if you've watched that show, you'll know there's like no one to root for in the whole show. Everyone's just like a horrible person. But like somebody's got to be this part of the population. And I just like, it cannot be me. But you'll see throughout that series how people try to change their stories, but they do it in the worst way possible. All of it out of survival and none of it out of living. And so ultimately we have to choose to live, not just survive. Going to Avatar The Last Airbender, we've talked about this lately on stream. If you look at Jet, he's surviving Therefore, his understanding of the world is only through the lens of surviving. He never gives his, himself an opportunity to live. Katara, 
As long as she's bitter and angry about her mother's death and angry at the Fire Nation for causing it, she's never going to be able to live her life. And I think there's something very important about this, that no matter at what point in your life you end up getting out the other side of your life, somebody else is in the, the chaos of theirs. And so you have to figure out how to live in your own life because this is about you. And it is about your relationship to the world. You can't let the burdens of the world stop you from becoming a better person because you know, if everyone did that, then the world would just consistently be in deeper and deeper chaos. And I'm an optimist. I don't think it is. I think people, generally speaking, when they want to do whatever they want every day, it involves relaxing with their family, watching a TV show in a reasonable way, enjoying work, enjoying their life, mowing their lawns, walking their dogs. Like, I really do think humanity as a whole is a relatively is good. This is my own personal belief. And I think I see that every day that I see people being good. I can walk outside of my house and go to the grocery store alone on a frequent basis and feel relatively safe. That tells me the majority of people are not unsafe. I've been able to do this in multiple countries and multiple towns and multiple places. And this tells me that something good must be happening in the world that allows little old me to travel around without any issues. Not every time, not perfectly, not in every way great, but generally speaking, I don't feel afraid for my life. And there's something about that that's so important. It's a deep realization that if you look at the world around you and you actually look at what's happening, for some of you in some bubbles, it truly is destruction and chaos. And for a lot of us, it's not as bad. But then we have to like really see the good everywhere if possible, because I think it ultimately exists more than the bad, whatever good and bad even mean in this context. So when you're looking at this formula, all of us are born into the world and we have to figure out our needs, how to fulfill those needs, how to get those things done, food, water, shelter, right? Then you have to figure out how to live. And this is why last week's podcast is so important because how are you going to know that unless you know who you are in the story, unless you understand your relationship with your basics, finances, which is surviving, right? Your spiritual health, which is your understanding of the universe, Okay your physical health, your relationship with this body, that's the thing that's going to get you to be able to do those other things. This is, as a chronically ill person, this is the thing that is so significant because this body of mine dictates a lot of how much I can work. And then, of course, in relation to that, my mental health. But often when one is out of sync, the others compensate, which is kind of nice. So much of our life is just components and parts that we put together to fulfill, or not fulfill, but to create the thing that is us and our relationship with the thing that is outside of us, existence. We are existing in a story. And if you don't like how yours is going, you have to change it. Not alone and not without help, but you have to be the one to author it. You are the author of your life. Nobody can change the way your story goes except for you and your participation in how and when people come, in, come into contact with you. Your story is absolutely impacted by others, but it isn't dictated by others. Does that kind of make sense? I think that's hard to conceptualize. People will come into your life and impact it. We ha you will come into people's life and impact it. But ultimately, we have to decide how to react to those people and what to do with that, that one moment we can. Um, in that one moment, because life is all these moments, we have to decide how to navigate that space. And it's really difficult. I mean, we're talking about a world where societally we feel pressured to like dress a particular way in order to be accepted, let alone believe a certain way or vote a certain way or act a certain way. And then we're always, because we're community members, worried about how people perceive us. And so you have to sort of decide how do you perceive yourself and then how are you willing to work with that perception of how others see you? I saw a comedy skit just last night of like a comedy guy who grew up in the like 80s and he said in the 80s, like his parents wouldn't let you say like, oh, that sucks. You had to say that stinks. And I grew up with parents who kind of, I had brothers in the 80s and I was born in 89 who same thing, like you couldn't say like, oh, that sucks. You had to say like, oh, that stinks. Or you couldn't say, you know, cuss words or you had to be, you know, you had to use like proper language. And then as the kids kind of the younger children sort of having a relationship with the parents changes things. This comedy, this comedian was saying that his sister was allowed to get a lot, get away with a lot of things. His sister got a tattoo and it was fine. Heck, his parents got a tattoo and it was fine. He's like, what the heck? When I was being raised, this wasn't okay. And he kind of continued that sort of expectation of behavior. And the whole joke is that he sits his parents down and says like, oh, you've been in bad company lately and it's really influencing you to be bad. And it's like their kid, right? It's the, his sister. 
all of that is like a social script and a construct that he was taught and continued. And his sister decided, I'm going to make my own construct. But she was also allowed to make the construct because she was the youngest and was met with parents who were older. And let's be honest, less inclined to be strict. My parents were certainly stricter with the older kids than the under, younger kids. So you're always impacted by your environment and the parents that you have. Like no siblings have the same parents, right? Because your parents have you at different times with different moods and different beliefs. And so you get raised differently. Like the parents are usually harsher on the older ones and softer on the younger ones as it should be. Not that they should be strict on the older ones, but that they should be sort of more humane, if you will, on the younger ones. And if the older ones were raised like the younger ones, their lives would have been different in the same way that if it was reversed. And so you have to take into account which storyline you were thrown into. I'm the oldest sister. I'm the second mom. I'm the one who bears the responsibility for how the kids are influenced. I'm the one who's the most outspoken. I'm the advocate in the family. I'm like a person who, you know, I do my own thing as much as I can. But when people need stuff, I get the phone call. I get it. Like, you know, I didn't choose this life, but I allow it to continue happening by answering those phone calls, by fulfilling the role, by also balancing my own need. I live in Europe. I don't live in America. I don't have the kind of relationship to my family where they would ask me to stay in America because they know that I'd be happier in Croatia. But at the same time, I do understand that by pulling myself physically away from them, I'm also going to get phone calls less. I'm also moving away from that role. I'm also shifting the narrative around myself while still being available and always having my phone on. The idea is like your story will shift and change. You can, you know, have a well-balanced relationship with doing your own thing and taking care of the people in your life. It is not selfish to care for your own life, but it is selfish to do it on, at the expense of others. But at the same time, it is not selfless to give up your life for the sake of others. It is just stupid. But we come from worlds, bubbles, cultures, where we convince, especially women, to give up everything they want in life for the sake of everybody else. And that just doesn't seem very rational. So how do we create a positive symbiosis with ourselves existing and existence, everything outside of ourselves in a way that keeps us steady? You have to know who you are, what you're doing in your story, and if you like the way it's going. Because if not, write a different chapter next time. Move the book into a series. Let's go. Part eight, part 10, part 12, part 14. And I know easier said than done. So if you feel like this is overwhelming and it's unfair and it's not realistic and it's not where you are right now, go back to last week's podcast. Go, go review my values podcast. Go back to my old podcast and see where you are in the journey and use the tools to get to the next step. Because if I went to 22-year-old Brittany and I said, oh, you're going to live in Europe one day, she'd be like, girl, you do not know me, USA, USA. She'd be like, you don't even know me. I would never leave America. And 22-year-old Brittany would never have left America. But 34-year-old Brittany did. And that's the point. Same name, different people. And that's really what you're asking yourself. Where am I in my story? And am I ready to be a different person? Or am I going to stay the same for the rest of my life? Which is also an option. Someone in, the, someone in the population has to be the category of people who don't change. And that's just their story. And then they die, hopefully in dignity. And that's it. And then the last person who will remember them will remember them. And then that's it. And so life will continue on thousands of years from now, 3000 years, 4000 years. We just existed for a, a second and then we didn't. And that's it. So in this cycle for the next 70 years we have together, what are you going to do with your life? And are you happy with it? No matter where you are in the journey, it's not about how nice your counters are or how clean your bed is, or how good your clothes look. It is ultimately the relationship you're having with yourself. So I wrote down on my notes, and I think you'll relate to this maybe, there are times when we are surviving where it feels like we choose jobs, eat whatever food we can get our hands on, and live in whatever cheap or available room is safe to rent from. And this is a huge part of surviving. When you're living, you're still covering the basics, but the needs are being met in relation to wants, in relation to what actually works for your life, and not just what gets the job done, right? So don't think about just getting the job done. That's surviving, which is so valid. Like I remember having 
the crappiest apartments, the worst places. I did not care. I just wanted whatever's cheap in a house. And that's what I rented. And now it's like, oh, okay, I want a little bit more than that. I want to live my life. I have a nicer place now. But the place is a reflection of where I am in my life, but not a reflection of my joy. Whether I was in a hut or a mansion, my joy is what matters. So if you're born into privilege and you're born into a mansion, you can be just as miserable there as you would in a hut. And that's why when we talk about enlightenment or monks or people going to the forest to meditate, they usually get rid of everything materialistic. Because if you need the materialistic to be joyful, you're not joyful. You're spoiled. It's, it's not the same. And so you have to let go of that attachment of comparing privileges to understand that the privilege is the existence itself. To exist is the privilege of figuring out how to live. And all of us are born free. We just come in contact or come head to head with people who want to play with that sort of freedom. Often because of a fear, we think of other, like all people are free, then we won't be. And the irony is like, no one gets to be free at the same time. We all just get to exist. And yet we were born free. So like the irony of all of it is that we're born free, but we're trapped under the constructs we create for ourselves. It's all a construct. Everything we're doing is make-believe and we make it up because it makes sense to us. So make something, create a construct that makes sense to you and that makes you feel the most free. That recontextualizes the fact that you were born free. That allows you to remind yourself like you are free. Even if the world makes you feel trapped, you are free. Something else that comes to mind is I was talking to a friend the other day and we were talking about sort of existing in the world and how I think you're more than your skin color and more than your gender and more than your body. And my friend was like, yeah, but like if you're a marginalized community, like these things matter. Everything matters. If you exist on the planet, the fact that you come head to head with somebody who might judge you for what your vessel looks like it can matter because it matters in that moment. But if we all examine that we don't have a choice in how we appear in the world, then we could sort of deconstruct this idea that it should matter. And the only reason it matters is it's because somebody created or was born into a construct that they believe in or continue, they keep the construct alive because they think we should judge people for how they're born into the world. But the truth is that none of us get a choice in it. We just exist. And then we have to... M literally radically accept that people don't have a choice and and then we have to decide why does this choice even matter what does it even matter if you choose to be this body or someone else's body or a different look or like why does that even matter and there's an implication that how you're born can tell people sort of what your life will look like but the irony is it only tells you what your life will look like because we know how other people will treat you not how you or what you would do with your life would change if people didn't treat you differently because of it the reason I think we're animals on a planet is because we move with this like biological experience in a direction where the constructs stay alive out of mostly survival and out of fear. And so fear and survival are the foundation of society. Then of course, we're not going to learn how to live our lives. If bias and prejudice, racism, assault, violence, and murder exists, even in peaceful communities, whatever peaceful even means, then we must know that we're having sort of a relationship with our biological experience, right? So I think for me, when I say you exist outside of this construct of a body, I mean, you exist outside of the perception other people have of you. You know who you are. And that's what really matters. And the truth is, is that it can be first a very lonely journey to realize people don't see you. And then it becomes a not lonely journey because you realize you've let go of that need for people to see the false, like a false you. And it's better to wait for people to see the real you or at least parts of the real you. Again, I never have the expectation that people will see me, see me fully. I only have the expectation that I should pick people to stay in my life who see enough of me to not make me feel like I'm being perceived so incorrectly that they could sort of come to a reasonable, within their brain reasonable conclusion that I'm the bad guy. People who think, you know, you're the bad guy when you just live a very normal and simple life, they're dealing with their own issues. The the realistically, all of us are basically doing our best. Even when we're in suffering, even when we're in fear, it is the best we can do in the moment. And that's why we have to move for better. Because your best isn't saying you're doing 100%. Your best is saying you're doing the full 7% you can do right now. 
right? I do a solid 83% every day. I always, I like, I always say, but like you're aiming for your, this is what I can do. This is my best right now. So we're all doing our best always, but maybe tomorrow we can do better. And that means shooting for a version of yourself that knows itself better, is more disciplined and moves forward. Like I said, somebody in the population has to stay stagnant, stagnant because that's the history of humans. I can't have that be my story. I refuse. But maybe I was born to be a person who refused for it to be her story. Maybe I don't even have a say in the fact that this is my personality, these are my genetics, and this is my biological predisposition. Maybe it, my fate was fulfilled for me before I even came into the universe because the fact that I even am here and I was a little sperm and egg that came together and became this consciousness, maybe it was all written for me. Or maybe I just do whatever I want. Now that I know what that really means. Within reason, in relation to me existing and everything outside of me existence. All right. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. Leave your comments in the se sections down below, and I will see you next week. Bye. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me Cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, da, 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 da.